If you are stuck in the grind and don't know how to get moving, if you have lost your dream or struggle to know how to make it happen, if you have been dreaming of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Add Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life with tools, knowledge, and support that will allow you to create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from the work they do so they can live the life they desire. You deserve it. It is possible. This show features interviews with people who have already created success in their lives and businesses and stories about everyday people living extraordinary lives. It's time for you to add value. Today's guest, Jacqueline Riccio Stover, is a certified health and life coach. She helps women stop dieting, stop binging, and find long-term balance with food. She's also a four-time marathoner and host of the podcast, Actually, You Are a Real Runner. She helps listeners become consistent with movement and self-care. Jacqueline, I am so thankful that you're willing to come on the show today and just share with us your journey and, and story and uh, just excited to, to have you here. Thank you. I'm really excited to chat with you. You got to be on my podcast and it's just great to connect with you again. So thank you. Absolutely. So um, kind of the same thing. Why don't you tell us about your journey and what got you to become an entrepreneur? And yeah. What yeah. So I started out um, as a teacher and it's kind of weird because on the one hand, I kind of thought I wanted to be a teacher, but I also it got to the time in college, it was like, you need to declare a major. And I was like, yeah, you know, I volunteered at schools and I worked with kids when I was in high school. So I declared that as a major and I got into teaching and I taught for um, seven years in public education in Chicago and I taught in Atlanta and in Phoenix for a while. Um, and it just wasn't what I wanted for myself. Um, there are some things that I love about teaching. I love kids. I love the actual teaching part. Um, but the managing stress or work-life balance, um, that was just not something that I knew how to do. And I think especially with the managing stress and like the self-care piece, no one really teaches you, not just like teachers, but anyone, anyone coming up, you know, you graduate high school and now you're on your own as an adult when you're 18. And it's like, you're a baby. And unless someone's explicitly taught you how to take care of yourself, you probably struggle a lot through your 20s with <laughs> drinking and food and access to fast food and all these things. So in my 20s, I was like, you know, teaching is really cool. Helping people is really cool. But I knew that I needed to make a shift. And so I did. I was like, I, I need to do something else besides what I'm doing. Yeah. And so so what did you what did you start out doing? Yeah, I wish that I had known like, but it was very similar to like, you know, I was okay, it's time to declare your major in college. I left teaching not knowing what I was going to do. I did not have, you know, like, oh, I've always been interested in this field. Let me go to that job. And I didn't really have connections with people. So there was a lot of searching <laughs> involved. And I did a lot of things because that's what you have to do. You know, like, okay, I have to make money, right? And so I was a nanny for a while. I worked at tutoring centers for a while. I worked at a couple of tech startups here in Chicago. And then we actually moved to Atlanta. Um, and I worked for a tech startup in Atlanta for my husband. Uh, we moved there for my husband's job. And so I was there. And it um, during this time, I also started a blog. So like I mentioned, I didn't know how to take care of myself when I was a teacher. I didn't know how to manage stress. Um, I didn't know anything about like working on your mindset or self-help books. Like this was all new to me. So I started this blog and was kind of like working through my own like self-care journey, um, figuring some stuff out with exercise. I wasn't exercising when I was a teacher, so I was like learning to run. I became a runner, which is where the name of my podcast came from. But like I became a runner and kind of like pursued different things. And um, it got to the point that the tech startup that I was working for in Atlanta, um, it was just a part-time job. And as it was supposed to move into a full-time job, sat down with my boss. We talked about the details of what the job would entail and what the salary would be. And when he offered me the salary, it was the same amount of money that I made in my first teaching job 
in 2007. Ouch. Right. And I was like, it, I think I might have even laughed. Like, like, are you kidding me? Like, are you, so it was really easy to say no. Like, it was like, well, no, I don't like, I didn't actually even want the job. It was kind of like, well, maybe I'll do this. But I was like, I cannot lower myself that much. I am going to figure out how to make money on my own. And even if I don't make that much money, I won't be working a job for someone that isn't really respecting me or doesn't like see potential in me. Like I don't want to work for someone who doesn't value me. So I started doing things on my own. And again, I wish that I had this clear path, like, oh, I'm going to go do this, but I didn't. Right. And so I mentioned like I was blogging, I had just started running. And so I kind of figured some stuff out where I started a running podcast, kind of sharing my journey with running. I started interviewing other people, worked on the blogging thing, went and got certified um, as a health and life coach. And then people kind of like started gravitate, gravitating towards me. And I kind of started working with people and helping them on their health and life uh, fitness journeys, um, kind of a bunch of different things. But yeah, it was, again, like, this has not been a clear path. And I would even say still, like, I don't have like, ah, that's exactly what I want. It's been really murky. But I think the more that I do stuff, the more clarification that I get by taking action, which I know you're big on too. Like, you got to take action to figure things out. Absolutely. I like, I just like that figure it out, right? Like, it's almost a scientific approach. Well, I'm going to try this. Well, that ain't it. I'm going to try this. Well, that ain't it. And, and I think that's one of the things that is unique about entrepreneurs is that willingness just to experiment with their lives. <laughs> yes. Well, and I think too, like, I know a lot of people who, you know, you stick in a job because that's the job that you had or that's what you went to college for or that's what you know you got a good job and you know great healthcare um but like they're not necessarily happy in that job right and so i figure i i used to call it like the choose your own adventure life like right like i want my life to be an adventure i don't want to have to live according to rules that someone else made for my life like it really is cool being able to craft my day and my schedule and my summer vacations or our winter vacations or our road trips according to how I want. Absolutely. Choose your own adventures, a fantastic approach. And, and there's so many people that have settled and, and they aren't happy. They're miserable and they don't think they have any other options. It's so true. And it's, what's so crazy is that sometimes like, like, um, I, Gary V said this, he's like, this internet thing, like we don't, we've, we've just touched like the surface of this internet thing. And it's so true. I mean, we've seen like even just the last year and a half, the growth that has happened online and with online businesses. And there's so many opportunities that did not exist two years ago. And so like, if you do just settle, it's like, there is so much out there that's possible that it just hasn't been created yet, right? It ha it just hasn't, it didn't exist 10 years ago. There's so much opportunity. Well, that's because the people that have the ideas or the thoughts don't think they can do it. And so they're sitting at, sitting at their job, miserable and unhappy, and they're the ones that are supposed to be filling in these spaces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because if you, I mean, again, a decade ago, I didn't see myself doing what I do now, I didn't know that that was possible. I'm very much an introvert. So even something like this, this is not something I would have been able to do 10 years ago, but it came through practice. Like, okay, well, I can talk to one person I know and get practice there. But um, yeah, like you get into, this is what my degree is in. This is the path that I'm on. I'm going to have the kids, the you know, the husband, the wife, the house, the kids, and stay in that box. But forget that like, there are all these other things that you can do besides just that cookie cutter life. Well, and I think some of that is, is obviously you mentioned mindset, but some of it is the mindset that you, you take these obligations from your family or expectations. And many of those expectations that we place on ourselves that all oh, mom and dad expect me to be a doctor or a lawyer or expect me to have a regular corporate job. Um, how did you push beyond that kind of expectation? Yeah, that is so true. Cause yeah, if I looked at, you know, when I was in college, I probably thought, oh, I'll get married to someone that I go to college with and we'll be married at 25 and, you know, 
we'll just like create that life. Not, that did not happen whatsoever. Um, but I, it's this interesting thing. Like I have a good relationship with my parents where I don't think they push a lot of stuff on me or at least they don't openly judge and like <laughs> put me down. I know there's been times that my mom has said like, you know, oh, you know, working for yourself, that's really, you know, that's scary. That's unstable. Now, my mom's dad was actually a photographer growing up. So he had his own business. And so she saw, you know, it is stressful if you don't have income coming in. Like that is stressful to not have a steady paycheck, but also it's stressful to go to a job that you don't like. Right. And then my parents actually, they had a business. They, um, they were in a deli for a while. Um, and food margins, that's, that's a very hard business to be doing. Um, and they closed it up when we, uh, were kids and we like moved um, to the suburbs. But so they, they understand like owning your own business is tough. Um, and so I know that my mom, yeah, there's been times that maybe she's been a little worried or my dad too, like, oh, maybe you should go. But it's like, I also learned this thing too from a book, um, Jen Sincero in You Are a Badass or one of the books that she wrote. And she was like, you don't have to share all of these parts of your life with people you know that you're going to get pushback with them, they might not get to be a part of that. Like if they're going to squash those dreams, they're going to, you know, put you down. You just don't have to share that part. And so I think that that's something that I did eventually learn. Like, you know, I can still get on the phone with my parents, but I don't have to tell them about every little hiccup that's happening. Cause that is part of, you know, being your own boss. There are tons of hiccups and it's on you. So it's like, I don't have to tell them each and every part of that. And like, hear all of their worries and thoughts. I have enough of my worries and thoughts. I don't need more from them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and they're really, they're, they're, they're trying to protect you. Right? 100%. It's, it's not that instinct of your family and friends to tell you, whoa, that that's risky. Oh, maybe you shouldn't do that. Oh, just go get a job. Um, they're, they're, that's part of their brain. That's trying to protect you, right? Like our brain is designed to protect us. And, and that's what a lot of holds a lot of people back is, they get an idea, they get a thought, oh, I could do this, or I could run my own business, or I could create this. And and their brain says, whoa, that's new. New is bad. <laughs> new is dangerous. And and our brain says no, and we let that idea go. Yeah. And it's the same with our our parents are really just just trying to say, Ooh, that's you know, that's risky, it's unknown, it's off the edge of the map. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you shouldn't go off the edge of the map, right? <laughs> so and I think being able to realize that, and that's something I talk about with my clients too, like when we, is like knowing our parents are just serving the role that they're supposed to serve, right? Like they are there to protect you. Parents are there to protect you. Sometimes it might come off as nagging or it might come off as annoying or whatever, but it's like they're just serving their role. And so I think for me, like if I do hear someone, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure my husband has maybe said some things too. And it's like, right, like, everyone wants to feel safe and this is risky. This is different. Um, but yeah, like you can, you can understand someone's intention and it not, and it doesn't weigh so heavy or you don't, it doesn't hold so much. It doesn't hold so much weight. Like, okay, well, I see what you are trying to do. Cool. Thanks. Then I'm still going to go do this thing. Absolutely. So what was the most valuable tool in building your audience? Um, do you mean like, well, I, a, a couple, <laughs> a couple, um, I, for me, I think podcasting, is that what you, is that the kind of, sure. yeah. Okay. So I started my podcast, it's in its fourth season. Yeah. And I, podcasting has been so amazing because I get to connect with so many people and that brings their audience to me, my audience to them, whether I am, you know, the expert that someone needs to hear or I can connect them to an expert. So I think that that's a really cool part too, that I've learned how important it is to network with people. Um, and I know your business add value to life. Sometimes my purpose in having the podcast, my purpose might be to serve my audience, but it also might be to connect them to someone else that can serve them. The other thing that I love about podcasting is that it exists <laughs> forever. So podcasts that I've done, you know, like three years ago, I was on this one woman's podcast. I still get people coming in from her who are ready to buy and like ready to work with me. And so it's really cool that it still exists there out on the internet mm -hmm. and that it's still being accessed because, you know, you put a post up on social media, you put a post up on Facebook, 
or on Instagram and it lasts for like 30 minutes. And then you're like, why did I spend all this time doing this thing? It's, it's gone. So I think podcasting has been so great. And the other thing too, for someone like me that, you know, I'm generally an introvert video sometimes is really hard doing a live video that can be really scary. Um, and so on days where I do like, Oh, I don't really want to put makeup on or whatever. It's like, I can record a podcast and it gets done right on to have like special scenery. Um, the other thing, some podcasts that have done really well are just when I'm out for a run and I put on my headphones and I'll record it with, um, anchor, which is a free podcasting app. And I will record it on anchor, download it, upload it to my computer and put it onto mine. Um, or there's other, there's been other podcasts too, where my husband and I have been in the car on a road trip and we'll record one. Or, um, I, I recorded one when I was running a marathon that was really, really hard and I hated it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I think that podcasting, I mean, it's the present and it's the future. Like it is here to stay. And I think what's so cool about it too, is it's such an intimate experience to be in someone's ear. Um, and to know that, you know, if someone's a podcast listener, they're invested in hearing you in their ear on their commute or on their run or on their walk or whatever, um, versus again, a social media post that lasts for 30 seconds and they kind of flip through and they're like, oh, whatever, I'm on to the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the people I interviewed and I use, I use StreamYard, which is yeah. a little different for some folks, but I know you and I used Zoom and she uses Zoom for all of hers and Zoom has a, a feature to put lipstick on her. So she doesn't even do her makeup that Zoom puts lipstick on so that her, and it, it, it works. It's like pretty impressive and, and uh, actually fun. People started putting mustaches and eyebrows <laughs> and all these other things, but the lipstick is, is just for her quick and easy. And it's always on in her Zoom settings and she doesn't have to do her makeup to go live. <laughs> That's hilarious. It, I love it that. It is. It, it actually works really well. Um, so you, you mentioned obviously developing your confidence. What else helped you develop confidence in this process? Um, well, I, I worked with a business coach. I've worked with several business coaches. And one thing that one of the business coaches, um, she said was uh, the confidence competence loop. And she's like, basically like the, the way to get confident is you have to be competent in something. And so you can't just like, yeah, it's not like you can't just wake up one day and like, ah, oh, I'm confident. It's like you're confident because you're competent in the thing that you're doing. Right. And like I said, like I'm very confident in having a conversation with someone for a podcast. Um, that confidence doesn't always carry over to other things that I'm doing in life that I'm less competent in. But I think that showing up rep after rep after rep after rep, um, I work with a lot of people who know way more about nutrition or about running and I've read way more self-help books and I've gone to therapy for decades and they know all of this stuff, but they lack confidence because they haven't put it into action and they haven't gotten those reps in. So like, yeah, like confidence comes from rep after rep after rep and also messing up a ton. I've had so many podcast episodes that are just not good <laughs> and you're just like, oh man. And then you just move on to the next one. And I think with that too, is that um, when you mess up, it hurts less because you're like, oh, well, I'm in the next rep. Like, that's okay. Like that, I don't have to put so much weight into that one thing. Just move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. Well, I think that goes back to how you got started, right? Just figuring it out and yeah. being willing being willing to say, this is an adventure and I'm just figuring it out. And and so those, those ones that feel like, oh, that was bad aren't near as bad because you're like, oh, that was bad, but look how much better I can be. <laughs> it was so cool. So actually the end of last year's season, I went back and um, for the podcast episode, I put up my episode one uh, and I was like, we're going to go through this. So I had like a little intro and then I had the podcast and then I had like an outro just kind of like, wow, thanks for listening that to that with me. You can hear, you can hear my voice in the first episode was so shaky. I think I had written down everything that I wanted to say word for word and recorded it like seven times before I put it up. And it was like, you know, I was still shaky and nervous. And, um, and now it's like, I write a few notes down. I'm like, all right, let's record this podcast. Like, let's get it going. But like, 
it was really cool to hear the difference in my voice. And again, that confidence only came because it was 200 episodes and you know, however many live videos and constantly talking um, that got me to where that was. And I actually got a really like a lot of feedback on that of like, you know, it's just so crazy to hear the difference in your voice. And I use that message too with clients of like, right, like you have to show up, you have to take action. Like nothing in nothing in your life is going to change, whether it's your career, running, exercise, your relationship with food, nothing is going to change unless you show up and you take action and you're okay that it's not going to look perfect from the beginning. Well, and, and it's the same thing in running, right? Like you didn't run a marathon your first day you put on running shoes. No, <laughs> I did. I definitely did not. Yeah. And, and so recognizing that that process is the same, right? Um, working your way up to 26.2 miles, you know, takes <laughs> running. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you don't just read the book about the running. You actually have to go and do the running. Absolutely. And so that's, I think all of those things are just really you know, recognizing that process and recognizing the the, the journey and the, the smallest step, you know, mm -hmm. what do I got to do today to get to that 26.2, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, even with all the preparation, 26.2 hurts the first oh, time. Oh, yeah. It's it still might hurt every time. Yeah. <laughs> it's still awful. And you're like, why did I, I paid him? I pay money for this? Okay, great. I paid money and I worked all this time to get here. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Yeah. 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 So, so did you experience the runner's high at any point? In the, in you the do. Yeah. You know, I, um, I love running long distance and it's so funny because like, I just, it's, um, running. I was not a runner growing up. So running again is like a, a metaphor for like, Oh, you can do hard things. Like you're literally doing it right now. You're doing something that was so hard for you. you. Never thought that you would be able to do it. And so even during the training, sometimes I like, even during the training, I'm like, wow, you did this for, you know, 16 weeks, 18 weeks. And you did this by yourself or you got yourself out of bed and you did these things. Um, so yeah, you get it. You, I feel good. It's, it's yeah. Right before you're about to go running is the worst part. And maybe the first mile, the first mile kind of sucks. And then you're like, all right, like, this is fine. This is good. Feel good. Yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> so let's talk about the importance of character as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting because, <laughs> again, like I told you about my experience in that the startup world. And I, um, when I left teaching, I didn't really understand business and it was my first experience like outside of public education. And I was like, wow, you come across a lot of things and you're like, oh, that's kind of sketchy. Um, it's really important to show up and be the best person. Again, this kind of can take like a spiritual side, right? Like we all have to like be authentic. It's important to be authentic and to like kind of be that person on someone else's journey. Um, I don't know, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with like the hero's journey. And um, I think it's really important as an entrepreneur to serve that role as being a hero or the, the guide on someone else's hero's journey. Um, and so when you look at like businesses that are out there or products that are out there, companies that are out there, I think that that's really important. Absolutely. I, I love, love the hero's journey and a big part of what I try to do for my clients is helping them rewrite their story. Mm recognizing that your story is not set right you, you can rewrite not just you, you can rewrite your past and, and you know how you tell the story about your past you can't change the events but yeah. you can change the story and then of course how that impacts you know your present and and future story because so many people's past story is is holding them back they're either victims of of terrible things and victims of of, of current circumstances feel out of control and really it's about empowering people to understand that you control your story and and you can take those terrible past events and tell a better story that helps you in your present be free to to build and create the story that you want um and so yeah i love love that hero's journey and and stepping into people's lives and and walking them along the path long enough to to help them see 
a, a much better and brighter future for themselves. I was gonna add, yeah, like that was something that I even had to do. Like when I left teaching was like rewrite my story about what happened. Because when I first left, I felt like I was a quitter. Wow, you just invested all of this money, time and money and you're leaving. Like what, you know, you suck. There was a lot of shame. I actually remember visiting, it was uh, my husband and I, we ran our first marathon and we were in my college town. And I remember visiting some education professors and I felt a lot of shame about leaving education. Like, wow, they're gonna feel so disappointed in me. You know, I'm such a terrible human. And I got lunch with them and they're like, you know, we're not in we're not in public school and these public schools anymore. Like we're in universities, you know, like you're not a bad person. You just moved beyond and you, you know, you had, to, but it took years to rewrite that. Cause I did keep seeing myself as a quitter. And so I love what you said, like helping um, clients rewrite their stories. I had to help myself rewrite that story to get where I'm at. But I think that that is so key um, in anything that clients are doing. The thing that's probably holding them back is their story and the shame and the guilt that goes along with, um, things as well. Well, and recognizing what you're doing is still using all of those teachings. A hundred percent. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it just, and that's why I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like I like helping people. I like teaching people. I like coaching. I like breaking big things down into actionable steps. It's the same thing that I did as a kindergarten teacher. It's just that I could not, um, I couldn't be in a classroom for eight hours straight and handle 34 kids and um, be on the whole time. Like when you're a teacher, like I always thought of it as like, you have to go and be an actor in a play for eight hours straight. And then at the end of the day, you can kind of be off, but you also have to like do lesson plans and like now be your partner as you go home. But it was just like, I, I couldn't be on for eight hours straight. So yeah, it's a much different, um, much different circumstances, but still utilizing the same skills. I just had a great thought though. How cool would it be if you could get your clients all to take a 30 minute nap during? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They probably need it. They're probably going too too much a million miles an hour and need a nap too. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> so what, uh, what have mentors meant in your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. Like I said, like me, it's important for me to, be a guide in someone else's hero's journey. And it's been so important to seek out other guides for me too, knowing that this is, I can't do this on my own because um, one, I have no idea what the next step is, right? And so it's so important to have someone who has gone through something to help you see what the next step is or help you come up with other suggestions or, you know, whatever. Um, so I've had several business coaches, but I also think that all of the podcasts that I listen to and all of the books that I read, like those, the authors of the mentors, I know we talked about, um, James Clear, like I, I highlight James Clear. I highlight Atomic Habits as if it's like Bible study. Like it, every time I read that book, something else sticks out to me. And I was like, oh, like that's what he meant. And it's, I can apply it in a different way. Um, and also Jen Zinchero, I mentioned, she wrote, you are a badass. Um, Janine Roth is a really great writer. She writes about women and their relationship with food. But like, I see these authors as mentors, um, you know, sharing what's worked for them and what hasn't worked. And it helps me as well. Well, absolutely. And that's, and that's kind of what has become your current focus is helping people in the areas that you've found success for yourself. Um, and the story that you're able to tell. So talk, a little bit about self-care that you've learned and 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 are teaching and sharing. Yeah. So like I said, you know, in my 20s I had no idea how to take care of myself. I would go to school like I sometimes I wouldn't pack a lunch because I don't know I'd be rushing around and I wouldn't eat all day. Um and maybe on the way home, I would stop and I would get French fries. And sadly, like those French fries were the best part of my day because one, I hadn't eaten all day, and two, like they're salty and greasy and hot and delicious, right? <laughs> um, and then I would get home and I would just eat like a ton of food because I hadn't eaten all day, right? And that um, obviously was not a good way to take care of yourself. But looking back, um, I had to retell that story and I was like, you were doing the best that you could with the tools that you had. Is it the best ever? Sure, it sure wasn't, but it was the best that you knew. From there, I kind of fell down a rabbit hole of some restrictive diets. Um, 
counting calories, um, 21 day fix, putting food into little containers, whole 30, not allowing myself to ever eat anything. And those restrictive diets turned into a really ridiculous obsession with my body and making my body as small as it could be. And always on some, some diet, like always on something. And this really ruined my relationship with my partner. It like was, I was not fun to be around. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. Um, and then I would fall off the diet and like eat a bunch of food. And it just was really messed up. Same thing would happen with exercise where I went from being completely sedentary in my 20s to learning how to run, but then overdoing it, <laughs> trying to do two workouts a day. It just like I was so all over the place. And when I started talking with other people, I found out like I'm not the only one who's experienced these things and like these like going from being sedentary to overdoing it to not even knowing what to do with food and not even knowing what to do with exercise to now having like a really solid balanced relationship with food and with exercise. Um, and so, you know, Atomic Habits has really helped me shape what I do with clients, but it is, it's focusing on habits instead of like box programs. Um, I always tell my clients too, like, you are a mom of three and you, you know, you work in the corporate world. Why would you think that you need to do what someone that's on the cover of a bikini magazine? Why you don't need to do what she's doing. You need to take care of yourself and the body that you have for what you need your body to do. So that might look like wake up and go for a 10 minute walk with your dog before your kids wake up. Go go for a 10 minute walk in the morning or you know, take 10 minutes to journal. Um, work on some affirmations, you know, the, the usual self-help stuff that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, people that work on online businesses, they have, you know, they have those routines, but a lot of people don't have those routines in their day. But like go for a walk, um, drink a glass of water in the morning. Um, really simple things that are like habits that you can actually do, you know, at home, on vacation, anywhere, instead of trying to do these programs that are not simple, they're not sensible, they're not sustainable. Um, a question I always ask clients to kind of help them frame things is like, would you want this for an eight-year-old daughter or a young female in your life, right? And it's like when we look at like going for a 10-minute walk in the morning, yeah, you'd want that for your daughter or you'd want that for a niece. You know, reading a book, having a glass of water, would you want them tracking calories on my fitness pal and trying to eat 1,200 calories and like getting on the scale eight times a day and, you know, running 18 miles, like you wouldn't want that. So we really work on sustainable habits so that you would do have a healthy lifestyle and it doesn't become disordered eating or a disordered relationship with exercise. Nice. You mentioned the phrase, not the only one. Um, uh, yeah. How, right. How did, how did you, so that, really that's the imposter, right? The voice in your head that's saying, Oh, you're the only one you got, mm -hmm. you can't tell anybody about this. Don't talk about it. And, and that happens for entrepreneurs. It happens for health and health and wellness. And, and, and in a lot of areas, that voice in our head says, Oh, you're, you're the only one out of the 8 billion people on the planet that has this problem. So you better keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get past that voice? Or how do you deal with that voice? Um, yeah, right. Because it's not good. Because it's still there. It still pops up. So I think one of the habits that I mentioned that is so important is um, reading books. Because the more the you will you read books and you're like, oh, this person is literally talking about this. And I was thinking about when you pointed that out. And I'm not the only one. Um, a really great author is Brene Brown. She is a social worker who writes about shame and vulnerability. And she literally has a book called I Thought I Was the Only One. Um, and she has another good book that I love, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection. Um, Daring Greatly, I'm listening to that on Audible right now. Um, but when you, I think that knowing, like, knowing that you have these voices in your head and having voices in your head doesn't mean you're crazy, like you're, you're just a human, but like being able to, to, to distinguish them and hear the thoughts that they're saying and not always having to believe that thought. I know for me, something I learned from Benny Brown is, um, I use this a lot, is uh, the story I'm telling in my head and it helps me become aware. Um, my brain you know, runs a million miles an hour, but if I can slow it down and say that out loud or even better, write it down, I can do like a brain dump 
of everything that is going a million miles an hour in my head and slow it down and kind of like, wait, like this thought is ridiculous. Like what, like what is even happening here? Um, but yeah, it's like we can, our thoughts can be our worst enemy or we can catch them and we can turn them around and actually help th have them be helpful. One of the tools um, that I started doing and I give it to clients too. It's a really, really easy morning journaling system. Um, but it is writing three affirmations, starting with I am Steven. So like I am blank or I'm the type of person or I'm someone who, so you write three of them and then you write the number two and you write two pieces of evidence that those things are actually true. And then one thing that you wanna work on, you don't have to work on 10 million things, just work on one thing. Um, but doing that, reading books and doing the journaling practice, I think that it it helps me guide my thoughts the way that I want them to. And I notice if I neglect doing that, um, I get hijacked by those thoughts. And I like fall down this rabbit hole. I'm like, what even happened? And it's like your thoughts, like your thoughts made you feel these feelings and started this whole big thing, this whole big story that isn't even true. Like this doesn't even exist. My husband will catch me on that. He's like, you just made all of it up in your head and like, oh shoot, you're right. Yeah. Well, and that's what our brain does. Like it, it does. And I found asking the question, you know, just making the statement, isn't that interesting? Mm, can mm -hmm. stop the thought from becoming something crazy and, and, and really challenges the subconscious to go, well, why is it interesting? Because if our subconscious is looking for something that's interesting, it, it looks at a different perspective than the idea that, you know, oh, you can't do that. Or, you know, why would you think, you, you know, you could do that? And, and those other things that your brain comes up with and by changing it to something, oh, isn't that interesting, changes the focus. Um, and But I like the journaling. Those are, that's a terrific tool. And of course, reading and recognizing that, of course, you're not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. obvious you're not the only one, right? So I'm going to turn the table just a little bit just to uh, to switch thing up. What was your most memorable date? Ooh, um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> um, so let's see. I, I feel like, okay, um, for our honeymoon, we went to Thailand. So it's a date. Because nice, does yeah. Thailand, honeymoon kind of a date. Yeah. <laughs> my husband and I have been together for 12 years. We've been married for three and a half. Um, but um, being in Thailand, um, one of the places that we stayed, he planned all of this adventure. And we went and walked with elephants. And it was like a, like an elephant sanctuary, a safe one. <laughs> We're not like beating the elephants or riding on top of them. But we just walked with elephants on a mountain and it kind of, it actually, it ties into the entrepreneur life too, because that was the first time that I traveled while working. And I was like, this is so cool. Like I should be at home in a classroom right now, but instead I am in Thailand with the love of my life with my husband, like doing something that is just so absurd. And, but yeah, we got to walk with elephants and like feed them fruit and, watch them knock over a tree. Oh my gosh, they just like knocked this tree over. And we're like, okay, do not stand in front of the elephant because they will just knock you over. But yeah, that was a really cool adventure. Nice, that's really exciting. And and sounds so much fun. Like that's motivation to just keep doing what you're doing, right? Which has kind of been hard, like with not being able to travel right now. It's like, oh, it's like, <laughs> I want, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm with you there. So So how did you choose your niche? Oh gosh, I've had 8 million niches. <laughs> <laughs> so the, when I, um, yeah, I've had way too many niches and had to really hone in on who I want to help and how I want to help them. Um, I think when I first started, my blog was like jacquemarquio.com and I was just, you know, I was writing for me, like who, who wants to hear this stuff? Right. Um, but I think that when I started, when I started solving a problem that I was having, people kind of like caught on to that. And they're like, that's interesting. And the problem was, um, I, so, okay. I did Whole30. The last time I did Whole30 was February, 2019. 
February of 2016 and I ate so much food in March of 2016. Like it's like half a pizza and a chocolate cake and cookies and all of this stuff. And after that binge, I was like, you cannot go to another restrictive diet. You need to learn how to like be balanced and moderate with food. And so I was like, I'm going to learn how to have some pizza without eating all the pizza. I'm going to learn. Right. And so when I started writing about that, I kind of saw that it wasn't exactly what a lot of people out there were writing about when it comes to food. Um, and people started gravitating towards me. And so um, helping people, that's what my main coaching program that I have is helping people have long term balance with food. It's one of the most rewarding ones that the of the courses and the programs that I've done being able to see someone who has been dieting for 25 years, like, oh, this makes sense. And like two months into working, they're like, great, this is good. Six months into working together, like things are still good. Like I've never felt like this before. So that's been the most rewarding. But like I, the running podcast, it's like I started the running podcast. I thought I was going to go get certified as a running coach. And I was like, turns out I don't actually care about getting faster or talking about intervals or talking about shoes. Runners love to talk about shoes. And I was like, I don't actually care about any of that stuff. Running is just, running was a metaphor for doing hard things, but like being the fastest at running, I, I just don't care. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, obviously that's uh, one of the things you've done in your free time is running, but what else do you love to do in your free time? Um, so we, um, I love riding my bike. <laughs> we, I usually go to a co-working spot and I ride my bike there. My husband and I, we do long bike rides on Sundays. That's been so wonderful. I think that really started during the pandemic with like not having anything to do. Um, this year when it was safer to go to places, we actually joined a CrossFit gym and that's been a lot of fun getting stronger and like working out with him. Um, next week, I'm actually going to a farm um, in on the south side of Chicago to learn about urban farming. And I am um, hoping to start volunteering there and just learn more about urban farming. So I'm kind of excited for that. Um, I love vegetables and I eat a ton of vegetables. So it'll be really cool to learn how to grow them and help grow them. That's terrific. So what inspires you? What inspires me? Um, well, I think when going back to the hero's journey, I do see like all of us, all of us are both the hero and the guide. I think you're the hero on your journey. And also you eventually will become a guide for someone else's journey. So I think that fulfilling that role is really important to me. And I think every time like I work with a client and they say like, this was so helpful, it's like affirming, great, like you're actually doing something that's helpful and important. Um, going back to like why I had to like, I don't care about if you're faster or not. Like that doesn't like big picture, right? So learning, being able to help someone move along in their relationship with food where they just know how to eat, that feels so much more rewarding. Um, and I think that that does inspire me, like, you know, getting results yourself or getting results for someone, helping them get results. It's really inspiring. You want to keep doing it. You want to keep helping other people. Absolutely. You mentioned earlier about your podcast and being on other people's podcasts and, and how permanent that is. Um, how how is that helped in in developing connection or, or how has the value of connection been in growing your business? Yeah, I mean, right, like business is, it's so much about relationships. And being an entrepreneur, I'm sure is isolating and being an entrepreneur online can be really isolating. Being an entrepreneur online during a pandemic is crazy. Um, so relationships are just so important. Like if you don't have connections with people, I mean, it's like, when you think about the internet as the interweb, and you think about that, all of those connection points um, are so important. But they and they might come back later on. Um, I think about uh, Donald Miller, who's the author of Story Brown and Business Made Simple. I actually read Donald Miller's book Blue Like Jazz in college. He was a Christian. He was a Christian writer, um, and it was like non-religious thoughts on Christianity. And what's interesting is when someone told me about what was it, Marketing Made Simple or Building a Story Brown. That was his first business book. 
when someone said that name, it was like, I made the connection. I was like, I think I've read this guy before, right? And so it's each of those touch points, like that's that's going back, you know, 15 years that I read his book. But I think like each of those touch points, each of those connections that you're making, whatever you're putting out onto the, the internet, you know, whatever you're putting out into the world, um, it might come back a week later, but it might come back 15 years later. Um, I also think it's really important too, like, when you connect with someone and they know your niche and they know you know your stuff, they're going to be able to connect you or like they have a Rolodex in their head, like, right? So if I come across someone who needs your help, I'm like, oh, I got a guy. And if you come across someone who needs my help, oh, I got a guy. You got to go talk to this person or at least go to their website or listen to their podcast, you know, can get some of their information. Um, but yeah, connections, relationships, it's so important. You can't do this sales without connections like it doesn't it doesn't happen and and besides your podcast what has helped you make connections um i mean you know i'm on instagram and, and i'm on social media as well but um i think let's see it, it probably is putting valuable content out there like putting free stuff out there um, I think sometimes people are, are worried about doing that but um, when i talk to a lot of people who have brick and mortar businesses and are trying to move online, they're nervous about sharing their knowledge. Who's going to pay for this? But it's like, <laughs> no one's going to pay for your stuff if they don't know that you exist. Like they know you exist. When you're in the real world, they know you exist because they walked by your store or they were looking up chiropractor in Chicago, right? And oh, okay, cool here. I'm going to go here. But when you're online, like you need to have valuable information for people to even find you to know that you're legit. And to know that, you know, they can help you move along and get the um, result that you want. So, yeah, like valuable content, um, you know, across all boards, if that's podcasting, Instagram, YouTube, whatever. I think helping people get that first win, even even if it's free. So, so I encourage people, give away your best. Put your best out there and then people are willing to fall in love with you and they'll pay you for your better. Yeah. And, and that, they'll pay you for your hand too. Like they want, they, they want human connection. We're all humans. We want human connection. Yep. Absolutely. And, and it, but I, I do see that difference, right? Like people that are transitioning from, well, I think it's a combination transitioning from brick and mortar or transitioning from um, a poverty mindset or a, a, a less than abundant mindset and understanding that, that if you put the value out there, it'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that comes back in relationships or in, you know, in financial rewards and clients, but, but getting people to fall in love with your style and the way you work and, and the, the tools that you're offering is the most powerful thing that can happen. And once that happens, then, then people, people become your billboards, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> so what's, what's Jacqueline's big dream? Oh gosh. <laughs> it, um, I would, so we're in Chicago right now, but I envision this life where we are able to travel and I'm able to have a working business that works with that travel. Um, again, like I said, like being a teacher and helping people, that is really important to me, but also being able to live this life that I actually want to be living and exploring and, you know, having pleasure in my life. Um, that's really important to me. I think coming from a place where when I was a teacher, I was, I was kind of miserable all the time. I was a miserable person. I was not the person that I like really enjoyed and the poverty mindset, like, I never let myself do fun things. Like I was so worried about money and worried about so many things. Um, so being able to be that person that I want to be and be able to travel and explore the world. I, I mean, that's a big dream that I have. Fantastic. So I end every, every episode with the opportunity for you to share your words of wisdom to an entrepreneur. So what are Jacqueline's words of wisdom? <laughs> Um, I think it is, you know, get started before you have everything figured out because um, whatever you get started with, you're probably not, you might not even be doing that like 10 years from now. You're probably going to pivot at some point, but like you can't expect it to be perfect when you start. Um, you're going to figure it out with each rep that you take. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. That's great advice. 
Thank you so much. I've just enjoyed this so much and just uh, learned a ton from uh, from your sharing and just uh, so glad that we got to meet and, and share together. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, if you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. We have a free gift for you at add value number two entrepreneurs.com. We've created a collection of the top tips that have been shared on our show for entrepreneurs. Do you struggle with procrastination, putting off the work until the last minute? Well, you are not alone. Many of our clients start there. We are launching a new five-day challenge to help you take more action and make more money in your business. Each day is a 10-minute video lesson and a worksheet. If you take 15 to 30 minutes to do the worksheet, it will change your life and business and exponentially increase the amount of work you get done each day. Right now, it is only $27 and contains five of our best tools for helping you move forward. It can be found at addvalue2life.com slash action. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.